Okay. So why don't you start and then I'll go after you then. Okay. One second, I'm just going to... Hi, everyone. Okay, it says got it here. Really good to be here together again. It's been um, a real pleasure to have these weekly sessions. First of all, Soul Sisters getting together is always a blast. And thank God for modern technology. So today, brand new. Actually, this came, I was like looking at it. And it's like all these foods and like, wow. Uh, but and as I was saying the word take out, um, yeah, hopefully we're going to, we'll take a lot out of what we're going to share today. And it has helped me personally and uh, hopefully it will help you too. So I always like to start with some uh, spiritual guidance um, when dealing with, you know, trying to develop a greater mastery over our health, especially because the health of our body means a greater health of our mind, which means greater self-mastery and a greater, um, you know, ability to have more emotional mastery. So it really begins with, uh, as we've been learning um, from the book, Kuntra like the way we eat really affects our mind. And then the, the emotions follow suit. Um, when we're more um, mindful, those of you who saw the beautiful uh, Baruch Hashem um, presentation, I will post it, uh, um, you know, on my website eventually. It's also very exciting. We'll be putting all these graphics also into our uh, uh, upcoming uh, new cookbook, which I feel like is a um, partner with this book. Uh, cause in and of itself, it's nice to have healthier, uh, recipes. Cause like a lot of my clients were like, you know, I don't know how to make healthy food taste the good. So my kids won't, uh, you know, starve, uh, or my husband and I'm hoping my attempt to help them, uh, made it a legacy also for my own children and hopefully, you know, to the greater public, um, but it's more than just recipes. It's going to have a lot of what we've been covering in these sessions and also um, more, which hopefully stay tuned. Thank you, Hannah, who's like jumped to the uh, rescue again. She, as busy as her life is, as amazingly talented she is in writing her own books and her own, you know, a counseling, she is uh, here to help partner not only in these groups, but to make the this dream come true. So in the book, Kuntra Savoida, um, the Rebbe Rashab actually points out that there are four types of experiences that we can develop uh, during prayer. And these four specific points in the prayer actually can help us uh, almost like beyond brain training because it's a spiritual ingredient a spiritual mechanism that's taking place especially when we're more cognizant of what is happening while we're going through the process of praying we know that we go to sleep and we're returning our soul to Hashem we know that we're waking up in the morning and there's a beautiful prayer, Lukai Neshama, that Hashem is actually not a malach, not an angel, personally taking us through the four worlds up in Shemaim, graciously, hand in hand, almost as it were, bringing our soul back to our body. And it's waiting there. And the fiery prayers actually ready our body, kind of like a burning purification kind of like going to the mikvah of getting rid of the tuma that our brain and our heart got attached to as we were, you know, out of body when we were sleeping. So, and that's why we say in the morning prayer that we're actually returning our soul to God right now, as I'm saying these words in my prayer and I'm going through 
the spiritual practice of, of, of uniting my soul with God through these holy words that I'm returning my soul to God. And just like we went through the these worlds, you know, uh, to come down here, we're going back up. It's like, you remember Yaakov's ladder. We're building a ladder through each word, through each passion, through each meditation, through each awareness of what's happening while we're davening, that there's parts of our being that are being rectified and elevated. And, and those of you who've studied this before with me, we're going to do it in a way that's going to be a little more um, oriented toward rectifying bad habits of uh, the way you eat, bad habits of the way you may be neglecting your bodily needs, bad habits of um, maybe, you know, taking care of the world and not yourself. So we're going to have the intention while learning this to uh, kind of direct it toward um, the self care that we need to develop good habits so that uh, both mentally, emotionally, and action-oriented habits so that we will have uh, the right perspective while we're praying to rectify and elevate this part of us that needs help, especially those who have, you know, um, emotional eating habits or escapism through, you know, um, you know, indulging in things that are unhelpful. So, and if you have your sitter, please uh, bring it out and you can look and actually mark in your sitter that right here I should stop and this is what I should think about. So, from Modani, when you're waking up and you're like, you know, really thanking Hashem that he brought you back into your body, connect with your body. And of course, we're supposed to be grateful for a new day. We're supposed to feel like we're experiencing like um, almost like the revival of the dead. And, and this connection, as you're then taking your hands and opening uh, the, the gateway of purification of, you know, Nitilat Yadayim, where you're getting rid of the outer impurity and soon after, you're going to take those hands and you're going to actually open the, the, the Sidur, the prayer book, and you're going to get to the part from Modani to Baruch Shamar. This part of the davening is going to bring you to this world. Your nefesh, which is connected to your physical uh, you know, existence, your action uh, consciousness of, of, of relating to your body and hopefully not only rectifying the, the habits, the not good habits that you use your body in a way that's, uh, you know, whether not exercising or not taking care of your meal preparations or whatever it is that's lacking in your good habits, here's the time, especially now we're focusing on, on self-care. Here's the time to like focus and say, my nefesh, my action-oriented part of my being that has to do with uh, my body and the way my body works, I'm going to ask Hashem here as I'm entering this world of Asiya, where all elevations and rectification takes place, I can meditate on this. I can say, I need help. Now that I'm entering this holy zone, I can focus that uh, instead of like, you know, wasting my time at night, I'm going to, you know, doing things that are like really taking me away from going to sleep on time. Or if I'm going to be up a little bit, then I should do food prep or um, I, I should, you know, put an alarm clock to go to bed so that, you know, by this time, uh, giving me a warning, if I didn't do my food prep, you know, uh, you know, one alarm at this hour and maybe another, you know, alarm on your phone at this hour that now that's it, you know, now you're going to pray and do your Shema La Mita. Now's the time to, you know, have a little time for learning. And then finally, you know, and, and like see physically in your mind's eye, 
that when you're reciting these prayers, this is a time to prepare your action-oriented elevation. Whatever has to do with your body and the way you act, the way you speak, you know, everything that has to do with how your body is hopefully going to be more aligned to Hashem's will, more aligned to the true essence of who you are and the goals you want for yourself that you've been stuck and not being able to get out of. So write it down right now. Write it down in your sitter. Uh, I did in my sitter. Um, thank you, Hashem, and I will pass this out. I've been working uh, daily on this chart, um, which again, hopefully you're going to see it also in the cookbook, um, where we are going to um, have this, uh, and hopefully maybe you'll print it out in, in the meantime, so you can guide yourself in your spiritual, you know, as I say, diving into the divine of the, 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 you know, the spa of your soul, which is Domini, um, you can see a reminder in your sitter. Oh yeah, here's where my actions are going to be rectified and elevated. Here is where I can stop and really imagine my soul going to this spiritual gas station and filling up my spiritual powers to um, really give me the strength of my body to, 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 to align itself with what I know I want for myself. So that it, it's not like my body's going off a course that I, the, you know, so I can harness that ox of mine, that sheep of mine, that, that animalistic tendency of mine toward the actions that I have been yearning and longing and to have and to succeed in. So, Next one from Baruch Shamar to Baruch Hu. This is where my emotion, consciousness, the part of my being that um, maybe, again, we're, we're particularizing it to food addictions and health. You know, maybe you are emotionally eating. Maybe you really need Hashem's help to like, elevate your part of your emotions so that um that it's less of a challenge not as a uh, not as a struggle so that you'll be free from your addictions free from your bad you know um way of emotionalizing everything in your life that then you need to escape from you know eating inappropriately um maybe it's laziness it's not you're not emotionally eating i didn't have time i'm just ugh. Who wants to go do this uh, prep work? And maybe you need to rectify the emotion of, of um, a procrastination, laziness, whatever it is that's like emotionally holding you down not to, to take the actions that you want for yourself. Um, write it down. What specifically is your challenge? And maybe you don't know. Maybe now you're thinking about it. Yeah, maybe I am kind of lazy, actually. or Maybe I actually I really understand that I'm a pleasure seeking personality. The way the chapter one of Tanya says, some people are so uh, gifted with so much water element. And so their nature is to love pleasure and it's not their fault, right? Some are born frigid, no passion at all. They have no, I know some people like that. Oh, so easy for them. They're not tempted because they don't have the water element on, you know, like to such an extent. So when you reach this part of the dominating, you can, before entering this world, have a conscious, like, dialogue with yourself. Um, and uh, interestingly, I was reading this uh, Outpouring of the Soul book, uh, another Breslov book that you, like, you really, it's, uh, Torah teaches that you can actually talk to your body, you know, <laughs> and you can actually, you know, um, have this conversation with yourself a little bit as you're beginning to ask God what you need help with. And of course, if you do this kind of investigation before the dominating, then it'll be easier to like tap into what you need help in while you're dominating. Instead of just like uh, getting into dominating, think it's you have to do this deed and get it done and rush through it, you know? 
Um, so, because the more you use your earthy element in, in, in prayer, which means slow down, say the words, hear the words, you know, use your air element by speaking the words, use your fiery element that, you know, and be blown away and have on wonderment when you're seeing how God takes care of everything. And even though you can't micromanage manage your own home, he's micromanaging the whole world and the higher worlds. Like, like you're using your fire element and being blown away by Hashem's greatness. And the more you see how he cares for you and loves you, like the more you use your water element and take pleasure in God's loving you. And, and, and that arouses your love for him, you know, as the Tanya teaches us that you, you know, the whole point of saying that Hashem chose you over the angels is to say, I, I love you. And that's a preparation for Shema. It's a preparation to say, wow, Hashem loves me so much. So now I'll be aroused to love him. So use your fire, your water, your air, your earth, and enter the world of the ruach of your neshama, this part of you that has to deal with your emotions. This is the part of you that will be rectified, the emotion consciousness. And this is the part where you're going to be entering the world of Yitzira. The Before we entered the world of Asiya, where the body is being rectified. Here we're rectifying emotions because the world of Yitzira is where emotions are like um, stationed. The part of our soul that deals with our emotions is stationed there. So when we enter there, we're in for a gift. We're in for like this extra spiritual, uh, greater alignment. Um, so possibly, you know, a person is so depressed. The earth element has been taken over. They haven't used the earth element in davening. So they didn't build the foundation of their day. And they're so sad. And because they're so sad, they want the pleasure of whatever they're eating you know that could be very not healthy for them and even destructive very destructive so it could be a person so anxious right they haven't channeled their fire element they are super anxious they're gifted like it's like avina with so much fire but and they haven't developed the on wonderment of uh, indomining or, or you know so they tend to be very nervous. And so they, they're, they nervously eat. They're not mindfully eating. They're just out of nerves, you know, um, as if to calm their body down through the food. And then they get so overstuffed. And then because they're so overstuffed, they just so overfed their animal soul. And now the animal soul has a greater hold on them. So if they're the angry type, they get more angry after totally, you know, mindlessly eating. And if they're anxious, then they become even more anxious. For the moment, they might feel like it's doing something, but it's actually doing the opposite. And if they're depressed, they become even more depressed. And if they're argumentative, they become even more unable to harness the control of their mouth, whether the way they eat or the way they speak. So. The next part of the davening um, is from Baruch Shemar to Shema. And this part of our soul, our neshama, the part of our intellect, starts to enter the world of Bria. And again, this is the station of intellect and the, uh, and, and the part of my soul that's going to be rectified and elevated so that my brain will be a better functioning brain. I mean, Alter Rebbe talks about, uh, you know, during davening, it's a time of moichin de gadlos. During the time of davening is a time when your brain has the capacity to increase its spiritual, intellectual wherewithal. And science is even showing how prayer and meditation actually increases the physical size of your brain. And, I always say this, but I'll say it again, Dr. Sara Lazar, how she found that the, the 
you know, there were more neurotransmitters between and more cell communication between the mind and the heart so that the, uh, that the heart could implement the knowledge that the brain knows. And we know that our heart is our second brain and we need to get this vital information into our heart so that our heart will live what we know. So here is a, a key you know, ingredient to be able to strengthen the power of your mind so it can so that the mind can ride over the emotions, the anxieties, the sadness, the, the lusting, whatever it is that's coming from your negative emotions, and then to tap into the incredible um god gifted brain power that your brain has just as a human let alone when you fill up your mind with the godly intellect and and i, I always like get, give an example of a car and you there's only so much gas you can put in the tank of a car but when you dive in oh my gosh your tank of your mind is infinitely connected to god's infinite wisdom your chokhmah bina das attaches itself to hashem's chokhmah bina and das you're not limited by the physical four by four space of your head these are mystical powers that are beyond measurements kind of like the iron in, in between the two uh size of uh, measurements it was 20 and 20 and the total measurement was 40 but the arm was 20 so it really should have been 60 because our intellect is beyond time and space it's infinitely impossible to understand the infinite possibilities of our mind so here we're going and and here we have to think about I need to sharpen my intellect. I need to get my brain more involved here in the way I eat and not my just my raw emotions. I have to be really mindful. I have to take a deep breath, practice in my mind, visualize what I need to do to get and harness that power of my mind. I need to sit down, maybe calm my body down so I'm not like so frazzled and so all over the place. I need to like maybe say that little prayer before eating and meditate that like I'm, I'm at the, the table of Hashem. Like this is a holy thing. I, that my body is not like some, you know, toy. It, it, it's really the house of my soul. I, I need to like bring more conscious awareness to this holy endeavor. I need to like, then maybe learn something before I start my ritual of eating, you know? Um, because I need to really fill up my mind with some light of God's wisdom. So it'll be like a flashlight helping me when I'm looking at all the food and like, look at my plate and look like my body needs and not more than my body needs even if it's so tasty and i might never ever have that delight again because i'm never going to be in i don't know timbuktu and have this delight again you know sometimes you're somewhere like oh, so good i might not ever have this again and then you like you know go for it more than you should have and then you're like a mess afterwards so the neshama, the part of me that has to do with my intellect, enters the world of intellectual consciousness. I can pay attention. The, the, how to get my brain more involved in eating while we're focusing on just this. I mean, you can focus on anything you want regarding that. Uh, you know, action conscious and... and uh, emotion conscious and the intellect consciousness on all the things that you're you know want you want, want to succeed in in your elevation especially it's elul now wow it's rosh Chodesh. can you feel it in the air we have a spiritual extra soul right now that's going to give us this strength to really um take this to heart and um i gave a whole class last night um on just some i invite you to it so but i want to focus on right now what 
we're here to focus on, but Hashem is like smiling, beaming, meeting you, loving you in the field, saying, look at all your produce. I'm so proud of you. Here's a private invitation. Come with me. Let's celebrate soon in the palace that I'm your king and I'm your father forevermore. But so you're not alone. You don't have to fix yourself. You just have to like show up, make an awareness to Hashem that you can't do it yourself. You haven't been managing and he's the one that's going to help you. And especially Elo. Oh my gosh. Where this time? Giving you such spiritual uh, extra bonus qual uh, you know, uh, qualities that's in the air, they'll help you. So from Shmona Esri to Amida, I, I hope you're writing this down. And if not, you will get this. I'll post it soon on Facebook and also on our group, um, on my WhatsApp group. So um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in this part of the davening, this is where your chaya, your neshama that's transcendent. You know, we have three parts of us, the nefesh, ruach, and neshama, and it's like, it's here. And we have to activate it by davening, learning, meditating. But there are parts of us that are outside of us, kind of like there's clothing that's outside of us, and then there's a house that's outside of us. Like we're in the house, and it's outside of us. So the Chaya is likened more to the clothing, which is outside of us, but most closest to us. And the uh, Yechida, which maybe um, some of you have already learned that we really have access to it more on special occasions uh, where, where, you know, like Yom Kippur, it's like, it's rare that we have as much access to it, but when you study how to have more access to it, you'll be able to have more access to it. But if you're just like on your own, not doing anything to try to activate the Chai and the, and the Yechida, then um, you don't have so much access like you have the other ones. But hopefully after today, you'll know how to access it more. Um, the Chaya of our Neshama actually helps us transcend our intellect, right? Because our intellect is amazing, but, you know, our animal soul also is part of our brain. And, you know, it's confusing sometimes, even for holy matters. It's, it's not so clear. You know, it could, uh, our mind could debilitate us in more than one ways, even in regards to Judaism and religion. Let me tell you, oh my gosh, 35 years of people's stories and how they miss their brain, the Yetzirah in their brain misconstrued religion in a way that was so beyond not uh, really, um, anyway. Uh, so when we enter uh, Shemona Esrei, and especially every time we bow down, we bow down, it's like we remind ourselves, I gotta get out of my head a bit. That it's just like, I, I gotta get into my head, maximize its potential, fill it up. But like, I have to not too much rely on my own head because it can get me in trouble. I, I can't, you know, I need lots of counsel by davening, learning, uh, you know, but I need to like lower myself that me, my brain and I like, hello, I got to get out, get out, take me out. Like, and, and Amida helps us charge our chaya of our neshama to more like get us out of that limitless, limitness that the constriction that that it helps humble ourselves to go beyond our intellect and realize that we can get entrapped and not we need to get out of there and this transcendent consciousness and this is the world that we're entering is atsilas and in this world of atsilas we have the ability to tap into a type of transcendent wisdom that helps us see the world differently. Like it really helps, uh, Robert Ginsburg talks about the Chayab and the Neshama as it relates to 
marriage and relationships. He's like, when you tap into the high of your neshama by really praying uh, the Amida properly, and when you do um, meditate in your davening and meditate in your learning, you're, you're going beyond the extra average of just filling, you know, God's will. You tap into this part of you, and it's the type of wisdom that that opens your perspective beyond your your four wall vision of the limited intellect it, it's beyond you that you start to see the good in people that are not so easy to see the good in you start to see the world in in a more beautiful colorful way even though the world is pretty much the same like, whoa i'm the same person i have seemingly the same everything but now i can see things with my intellect beyond my intellect, because before I wasn't able to see it through the high of the neshama. And this part of the davening is what helps you activate it. And again, the more passion of using the four elements in all of these parts of the davening, a review, um, use your body, sway, you know, the earthy slowness of, thinking you know uh the air say the words the water take pleasure in this take pleasure in bonding with Hashem love cultivate the love of Hashem by realizing how much good he does for you through your gratefulness to the fact that he's telling you I chose you you're my my beloved you know Anila Dodi Lee you know Elo see the gift of how he takes care of and the greatness and the grandeur of his greatness and develop awe and wonderment of Hashem. This, using these four elements in davening, cultivating that, because you're doing it not just blah, blah, blah. You're using your mind. Your mitzvah goes to Lama Bria. You're using your emotions. You're uh, from intellectually understanding from your effort of understanding this and using your intellect, your mitzvah goes all the way up to the intellectual consciousness. Your emotions that you're putting into it with your hard work goes beyond even. Because you're doing it. It's not from the natural order of your gifted soul that God gave you the ability to love and have awe and wonderment of Hashem. This is from your power. And you put your part in and Hashem helps you transcend by far like a little seed and the infinite potential of that little seed to have like the sweetest mangoes and groves and groves of those sweetest mangoes like there's no comparison the the, the seed is bitter and the fruit is sweet and it's forever you know 100 years to how many years growing and growing those mangoes from one little seed one little mitzvah of davening, one little kavana, one little meditation, one little extra effort. It's beyond our calculation how much the byproduct that is coming back to us. Finally, the yechida of our neshama. This is beyond the worlds, beyond the tzilas. And this is something that you can tap into beyond prayer. Um, this is something that uh, what I've learned in Hasidus is when you really do self-sacrifice, you don't have money and you gave tzedakah, you don't have the time, you really need to work that extra hour, but you work one hour less so you will have a good dominant. You save a friend's life, you have, you're barely managing, you took the time and you helped with self-sacrifice. This taps into the Yechid of your neshama. This taps into higher worlds beyond the four worlds. This taps into the ability to beyond transcend yourselves in the wildest dreams. So when dealing with food addictions or challenges of emotional eating, enter these four worlds. Go beyond even your wildest dreams of how you can succeed because God is helping you. See yourself being able to tra transcend yourself. See the vision exactly like what normally 
10 years and I heard some people 12 years and some people 13 years and know people 20 years battling and struggling to keep their body healthy. And there, it's so hard for them. They can't do it because we can't do it without Hashem and without this protocol, without this spiritual practice of turning to God and saying, I know that it's only you and you only by me giving my soul back to you every morning and bringing it up the four worlds. So then I'm face to face with you. Panim the panim as it were. And Hashem then infuses everything we need to be able to have one more better day. And it's a cumulative effect. Each day, each prayer, each meditation, each time we go up the four worlds, each time we get a more fuller rectification and elevation of these important midos that we're here to do, tikkuna midos. We're here to elevate our emotions, our mind, our body, everything about us. So... Imagine now, like, can you imagine, like, I remember reading in Tanya how Valter said, like, as close as you were in Gan Eden, like, before you came into a body, one mitzvah allows you to be even closer to Hashem. And imagine every day returning your soul, Elkai Neshama, you return my soul to me, I'm returning through this morning prayer service, I'm returning my soul to you so you could help me and, and, and fix it and so that I can become even closer to you than when I was in Gan Eden. How fascinating and mind-blowing and exciting is that? And when that's your experience, you're on fire. You're like an open vessel to receive. You're Because you're, you realize it's not you. It's Hashem. So I do want to, I have um, some things that I want to cover here. Oh, and this was, oh, I have to give credit to Suzette, who has been helping me put this together. Uh, and she's so talented as well. Hannah, all your graphics. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm blessed. I have so many people helping me to get this to you. I can't thank Hashem enough. Um, now I want to get to a little bit of the um, body part. Um, so I just, there's so much to say, but this has to be done. Because uh, these spiritual practices is the key. But it's good to know and it's good to be informed and to understand um, the other aspects of dealing with for instance, your cravings. I happened to be at my in Palm Springs. We were at a detox place, and my um, sister had this magazine. And I'm like, oh, interesting. I'll read it. I took some pictures of it. I forgot. It's a health magazine, but I sorry, I did not take the picture cover to give its credit. But um, it, just some little uh, information about how uh, stress can make all the like too much stress can really cause us to gain weight. Um, there have been, you know, so many people with God forbid heart attacks and all kinds of serious illnesses, um, people fainting and blocking out and, oh my gosh, getting all these kinds of wake up calls that maybe they need to slow down. And many of these people um, have been, you know, uh, overweight and even did what they needed to do to try to, you know, um, lose weight to no avail. Um, and it's just like this vicious cycle of so much stress in their life and so much heartache of trying to do what it takes to get healthy. Um, so they, they did a research here that was published in 2017 um, showing the most compelling evidence 
that long-term stress is connected to being overweight, that the cortisol level goes sky high and it affects your ability to digest the food, make use of the food. And, um, and it's interesting in this magazine, it was saying that most people do uh, overeat more than 40% of what their body needs. 40%, not 5%, not 10%. Uh, and, and you can see it, whether, again, it's emotionally eating because they're so stressed or their animal soul is taking over, whatever it is that, 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 that a key ingredient is to de-stress. And what better way? When you sit down, take a deep breath, pray and meditate, learn. That's the best agent to de-stress because you're inviting your godly soul in. And when your godly soul is in, your animal soul can't stress you out as easily. Your animal soul can't take your fire and make you so anxious. Your animal soul doesn't have as much power to take over to make you feel stressed. Another interesting fact here, it says about cravings. Um, you know, because cravings get in the way. I mean, we know the happy chemicals. When we see that, it's like the dog and it's, the, ooh, you look at this and you're like, give it to me. And it's, it looks good and it's so beautifully presented. And there goes your instinct and your craving. Um, so, and many people like make people feel bad. Oh, you have no self-control, you know? Um, you know, stop giving into it. You know, you're not an animal, whatever it is, but you are, you are a soul. And yes, your brain has chemicals that take over, that make you almost enslaved to wanting that happy chemical. Um, almost as if, oh, look at you. You don't have any willpower. What's wrong with you? Like making you feel like an idiot. Like, yeah, I must be, God forbid. And really, the evidence is contrary. Top researchers and dieters are, were, are reporting that food cravings are a natural part of a human condition to strive to survive. And this is uh, Mark uh, Anderman. He's a neuroscientist who studies hunger and eating behavior at Harvard Medical School. I read this other book also. Oh, my gosh, the detail of how difficult it is for people like, you know, outside of this group of ours that knows the spiritual practices that really, and those who have succeeded in having more and more control over their animal soul by opening and the heart's passion of, and godly essence out of its imprisonment. But here he, he states, your brain is programmed from birth to act as if there won't be enough calories in the world. Oh my gosh, don't you sometimes sit, and especially around family, and if you don't eat your portion, like they're not gonna have, and maybe you're not gonna have tomorrow, and like this, this instinct, and you look at yourself like, calm down. I have so many stories I've seen people like attack the food, like grown ups, and like, you know, and Rabbi Munkis had a story. Everyone was trying to get this, this meat dish, and chatidim, and refined, and happened to be the reason why they were so attracted to it happened to be not kosher by accident the butcher brought i don't know if you guys know that story but he actually knew that this temptation of this food had to go so he took the food and threw it out and he didn't know it wasn't kosher but he saw how everyone was ravenously fighting over it that he didn't want the Hasidim to like go through this so he threw the dish out it happened to be the butcher came it's not kosher no, i hope you didn't eat it and everyone thought that Reb Munkus was a prophet. He goes, no, no, no. I just sensed there was something to this meat that was attracting the person, the people that I, you know, it wasn't, I'm not a, a prophet. Anyway, so back to this. Your brain is programmed from birth to act as if there won't be enough calories in the world. And um, it says, uh, like, Places like Somalia and Sudan, till this day, you know, they are uh, dealing with famine. It's not like it's such a, uh, you know, for some places in the world. Here in the industrialized West, in America, wow, everything's so, you know, 
we have so much available instacart oh my gosh every hour you want something it's at your door um but still you know uh our instinct what's part of our uh, uh psyche and and is a constant threat of undernourishment and starvation your brain is telling you you should eat high calorie foods whenever possible that's the go-to that your brain goes to because of uh you know our 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 brains haven't caught up to this new time period you know so it's it's very instinctual the happy chemicals also get ignited we have so much that's happening to drive us physiologically to fail so we need some extra spiritual nutrients to override the natural order of things so that we can transcend the natural order of the way our brain works the happy chemicals and everything else that gets in our way so that one we stop feeling like an idiot that we have no control two that we understand the challenge and three we understand what we need to do we need to understand the remedy from a godly torah perspective and i'm so happy that it's not just me and there's many others who've been following this method and have been succeeding and one of them our dear hannah Oh, Hannah Miriam, I just can't thank you enough. I, with all, I, I don't know, like sometimes I'm just like, what? You, you have a whole family, you have your own books, you have your own counseling, uh, you're doing so much and, and yet you constantly help me. I, 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 the, you know, I feel like no words, no words to thank you. The how many times you take clients and I know now you, your children are more home, so you're not able to take more clients, but the yeah. things that you've been doing uh, on the, wow, I'm so thankful. Yeah, it's been a little difficult, uh, but today, um, while I was davening, I, uh, I felt like Hashem was steering uh, with me and talking about, I think uh, maybe Adi or I think, obviously you, but I think Adi knows too. Um, the reason I'm actually owner of Jewish Plush Lane Magazine. So the reason why I started the, the journey was because when I had my third child, um, I almost died from childbirth. And um, and so I remember, I, I never actually talked about the time when I was like during the time in the hospital. And um, in those moments where I was going through, they were taking me, putting like tubes and everything, all of it in me. And um, and there was a period of time, I really, I was unconscious, but there was part of my brain that was conscious. And in that moment in time, I was, what, what I did is that I prayed. And the only thing that, only prayer that I said to Hashem was, Hashem, please give me one more chance. I have children. I'm a new mother. Please give me one more chance. When I got out of the hospital and I went through like a whole period of PTSD, it was a very difficult thing. And, um, and then I thought, I don't really want anyone to be in that moment of regret of saying, give me one more chance. I don't want anybody to go through the same thing. And so hence the reason why I started the journey, I was thinking of my children, I was thinking of my husband, I was thinking of everyone else. But that time and moment, it may be in the hospital and they, were, they might be pleading for one more chance. And so, and then I met you and I met you through the magazine and it's like a whole world open, uh, a whole a whole world options of of, of healing that I had no, I was not aware of, and and so that aspect of prayer, which I did, but most of the time people just do it automatically. It's just not something that 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 intensity, that kavana, that like that intention is is not actually there. So. 
so I actually got this, um, I was searching now, I'm really much into neuroscience and trying to find like the reason behind it. When you go through experience like that, you want to know why. Why did I get to the point that I was at that moment in time? Why? What did I need to do in order to fix it and rectify it? So I've been searching on the what it, when you what what happens in the brain when you pray? What happens? And it says here that uh, it reduces anxiety, depression, it improves mood. It enhances your well-being, the overall well-being, and it releases the hormone called oxytocin. And it also releases dopamine. Dopamine is 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 like the. Let me find it over here. Okay, dopamine is the hormone that we associate with happiness. Like for instance, like you know how they say, "Oh, if you eat chocolate, you're gonna feel happy." No, when you pray, your brain releases dopamine. And then and it actually it actually uh, connects or or wakes up, if you will, your your sense of compassion and empathy toward others and yourself above all. So when you pray, your your dopamine levels go up, oxytoxin goes up, and and also your sense of empathy and your sense of compassion and your sense of like togetherness also lights up. It's, it's, it's brings well-being, overall well-being. And so it's incredibly important that we, when we include it in, you know, it's on a daily practice because I've learned like so far in, in, in my healing journey is that weight loss is not, is not about like you stop eating and that's it. You, it's, no, it's so many layers to it. There's, there's also because we're living in a culture where, where food has been ingrained in us, it's associated with an emotion. That's, it's like, so like, if you see, watch every commercial, they, they play on our emotions. If you eat this, you're gonna feel good. If you, if you eat this, are you gonna be this? Are you gonna feel this way or that way? Are you gonna be this or you're gonna be that? And, and so when we learn, that through uh, CBTT to be able to detach, detach that and learn that we have to train our brains to detach that emotion from food, then yes, food is something that we need it, that we need in order to nurture our body, but it is not meant to be able to fill a void in an emotional void. That only that emotion can only be filled by Hashem and Torah learning. That's it. So when you get, it's actually kind of like, it's a way to, it's a discipline. You have to train your brain with meditation to be able to get there. So that way you have the discipline to follow, follow a, a, a food regimen. If you keep being at, uh, attached your emotion to food, it's gonna be really hard to, that's why we have the yo-yo, yo-yo moments because your emotions are out of whack. And so whatever, you know, you're at that moment in time, you're like anxious or whatever, and then you overeat. So it, that if you, if you read that consequence, like it's like, I feel this, so I'm gonna, and I need to eat this. And you don't even do it like consciously, you didn't automatically. So when you bring awareness to your, to your body and to your mind and, and your thoughts, and, and then that's when the, when the freedom happens. Because I was asked, how did I do this? That's how I did it. I found that the key to, uh, to detach the, my emotions from what I thought psychologically food was bringing me. And emo what, was, what emotion was, was, in a way, was uh, try to fill in. That's, that's exactly how I, I did it. And, and so um, that is what the kind of freedom that brought for me. And, and I know that when I, when, I, when I think every time I'm gonna eat something, I, I try to bring say, is this good for me? Or is this good for my brain? Is it good for my body? Is it, and I was trying to if bring those questions to, to my mind is like, is it good for me? Yes or no? And so, and also like me, I'm saying prep. 
prepping is so important. So that way you don't go into like the first thing that's gonna come out in the, in the, in the refrigerator. What I do is I I will, I, I just pre I pre chop my vegetables and I put it and I put it like in a little bag and I put it in the refrigerator. I go everything fresh and I chop it up like three or four days worth. And I put it like in and in order and I just take it out. So that way I don't have the temptation of of uh of uh, just grabbing the first thing that comes into my hand. So also like whatever you make for your family, tries to be something that, in it, that is gonna be for, for you as well. Because if we, if we cook like some, for example, if we cook something that is not healthy and it's right there, it is, and you're not there, you're not there and, and emotionally there, then, you're gonna go for it. So try to minimize the the uh, the temptations, if you will. Try to minimize so that so you don't get sabotaged. Try to minimize those moments while while you get there. So every mm -hmm. like, and know that and know that if you mess up, it's okay. You just stop and okay and why why did i make a mistake make it conscious write it down and then okay so then next time you'll do better and next yes. time you'll do better and next time you'll do better so and also and things like for example like this is what i'm doing right now i'm drinking water with lemon lemon juice cheers <laughs> Yeah, fresh lemon juice. And what lemon juice does is that one clears your skin, reduces hunger and uh, vitamin C. And, and so that's excellent. And uh, the other thing that I do, I went out and I, and I walked and I ran around the block. Sun, the sun is gonna give you the hormone. It's a hormone, vitamin D is a hormone. So it's a hormone is, is going to level up, help level up your hormones. Key to weight loss is, is hormones. You need to level up your hormones. One of the herbs that is excellent for leveling your hormones is black cohosh. Oh, I certify myself as an herbalist. Black cohosh. Go for organic kosher. You will find it at, at um, Amazon. You find everything there. Um, it will take for your body from like three to four months for the herb to work. And then if you couple that with sleep, one of the things that sleep is incredibly important for what? Leveling your hormones. And, and so many other things I was like looking into, because I'm writing my book, so I'm looking into that stuff. So um, it actually, uh, the lack of sleep, it increases your drive to eat more. Oh, you're taking me back to college, Hannah. <laughs> yep. A lack of sleep, it increases your aggression. A lack of sleep, it, it increases your lack of self-control. You may, Obviously, you become irritable, and then you, can, you cannot control your emotions, and uh, you're even prone to viral infections, especially cold, flu, uh, uh, and minor aches, pains. Your, your pain, your pain, your physical pain gets amplified. So if you're in, if you, uh, if you have like a joint pains or whatever, it's going to get amplified. You're going to feel it more. So like you're going, when you're like, you're like asleep and then boom, you hit yourself with that. Oh, like yes, you feel it more. Everything you're going to feel it more. So be mindful, be really mindful as to, as to, um, of your, of yourself and your own body and your mind and your soul. And the other thing that I do, I pray to heal him. It's incredibly important. It's so, so important. It, it goes like through, through all range of emotions, but it also is like a key. It's a key to, to the connection with Hashem. And for me, it suits me so much. And my, if I am anxious at the moment, all I have to do is dive in. And after that, I do to heal him. And it decreases my anxiety. And it makes me, like, it clears my head. Amen. And so, 
that's one thing. The other thing is that I wanted to do with you guys, if it's possible, if you have time. And uh, I am also a certified coach of, of emotional release uh, through Art and Color. <laughs> I'm a designer, so I went for that. And so, um, and helped me a lot. And so, because of the things that I actually fig uh, figured is that, that um, for me, well-being looks like this. When you, you think about like when you have a, when you have a, your child and he was a toddler, you know how toddlers are? You know that they, they like, they, they're so bold. I mean, they go climb the, the highest things and they don't really see the danger of anywhere. That kind of boldness, like they just go for it. But then I think that we should keep that boldness but also with the, with, with the wisdom of adulthood, both things. And, and go and go that, that, with that kind of boldness toward the goal of bringing that well-being. Because when we're children, we have that, it's such a stamina and we can run and run and run and run and play and play and play and play and play. And we have that happiness and we found happiness in the smallest of things. And as we grow and we grow, become adults, we are thinking of what we lack rather than what we have, that moment. And children, they, they live in the now, and what they have at the moment. They're happy because they're out running and playing with the ball. That's it. We forget that as adults. So having the wisdom, the wisdom of a child, that innocence and that boldness and that, that, that go-getter sense of a child, but also the wisdom of, of adulthood, both things combined, I think that is, for me, is like the, obviously Hashem in the mix, but that is like the overall, how wellness looks for, looks like for me. That's what I aim for. That's what I want to get to. And so, um, and so I wanted to do exercise with you guys. It's like very, um, it's, a, it's kind of practical. Um, I think Ari has done it before with me. And so um, if you guys, if possible, get a paper, shoot a paper. And uh, I, if possible, I want you to, like, to draw yourself. We're going to identify right now your, your, where, are your, where this anxiety, where are your feelings at? What part of your body are they at? So that way, that way you know if you're somatizing something. And, and if you make it conscious, then you can release it. Um, so first I need to draw yourself, but draw yourself as a child. It doesn't matter. You, you don't have to be like, you don't have to be an artist. You just draw yourself as a child as you are. However you have it comes out, that's fine. And after that, I need you to draw exactly, and not, not draw, not draw, but I need you to write down what you're feeling at the moment, right now. Positive and negative, both things. Okay, so once you've done that, I need you to pinpoint in which part, of, go with each feeling and pinpoint where each feeling is. What part of your body is it? For example, if, for example, I, for instance, when I, I, I'm, I'm uh, anxiety, happy, anxious, it goes right into my tummy or the head. So whatever, each feeling, put it in each part of your body, whatever that may be. And after that, give it a color. If you have colors, fine. If you don't have color, that's okay. Then you, you just put a color, just write a color of it. On each, in each feeling, this, this feeling goes with this color, this feeling goes with this color, and this feeling goes with this color.
Okay. So now that it's done, you're aware, look at it and, and look at it and read it and look at it yourself. Make yourself aware of what is going on in your body. So, and after that, I'm gonna take you through a meditation. So you have to be really aware of those colors that you that you are labeled with those feelings. Really observe them and really read them. Bring to your consciousness. It's very important that you do. So I need I need you to sit lie lie sit down comfortably in your chair. Once you looked at the uh, the paper, I need you to sit down comfortably. So close your eyes, close your eyes and we're gonna slow down your breathing. Close your eyes and we're gonna do breathing exercises. We're gonna breathe in, close your eyes. One, two, three, inhale, exhale. One, two, three. And relaxing. Rest your mind. Clear your thoughts. Right now, there's nothing but the moment, but the now. Clear your thoughts. Relax your shoulders. Every time you inhale, and as you exhale, relax some more. Keep breathing softly. Inhale, exhale. So I want you to really, to really imagine that you are in, in your home. And you were a child right there. That safe place, that, that place in your home that you felt safe, you felt happy. That favorite spot in your whole house. Breathe in and out. Keep breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. So, when that's it, when you're in that safe place, imagine there is there is a box in front of you. Open it. Open that box in front of you. box, there are balls of light. Those feelings that are right there. Every feeling that you have felt when you're, when you're feeling right now, they're right there. And then you feel Hashem's presence in front of you. And you know he's there. And you know that he wants to heal you. And he wants you, and he wants you to release those feelings. Those feelings of sadness, perhaps, those feelings of, of 
anxiety, those feelings of anger, he wants you to let them go and give it to him. There, and you look up. And he feels like he tells you, daughter, it is time for you to give me those feelings. Take those, that, those balls of feelings, those balls of energy and feelings of negative, negative feelings, and you just give it to him. And you see how those feelings go up to him, to his healing light, and they go to him. He just fades him away. And then he pours his healing light inside of you, all inside of you. He feels you in. He feels you so deeply. Every organ, every part of your body, every, every thought, every, every part of your brain, your arms, your, your lungs, your heart. Your veins, every part is filled with his light. You breathe in, breathe in his light, and you release. But that peace is such a peace that goes beyond. They can only come from Hashem. And then, and then, of inner peace surrounds you, it's inside of you. You open your eyes and you're that room again. And you're just a child. Smile. You hug yourself. You hug. You hug yourself. And you tell yourself, I love you. Thank you for this moment. Hashem, thank you for this moment. Move forward. Now I can have some peace. So open your eyes. So open your eyes and If anyone can say how they feel, if if was any any of help whatsoever, I would love to hear your input. I cried. I cried because it it meant so much, um, Hannah. Because um, when I saw the little girl that I, I drew, and the feelings the feelings were I felt lonely. Um, I felt sad, lonely, afraid, but hopeful. But when I realized that those were the, 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 a lot of the feelings that I felt when I was a little girl, even though like there were many reasons why to feel happy and all the good stuff, right? Um, being an only child, being alone a lot of the times um, and identifying that and, and working, you know, now from home through the pandemic and being alone, maybe that's going to answer Miriam's question as to why the weight went up because I feel lonely and it's the emotions. So it's emotional eating. I feel lonely up here in my office. So I go downstairs and find something to eat. So going back to what you were sharing earlier, Hannah, um, it reminds me also of Eric Erickson's um, The Five Stages of Development. Going back to that childhood, why do we eat? What was going on when we were kids? Were our emotions being recognized? Or were our emotions being shut down by, let me give you your bottle, let me give you something to eat. Or, you know, I'll speak, you know, on behalf of like my culture, you know, being Hispanic and Mexican, a lot of the times it's like you fell yeah. and the first thing that they would do was stuff something down your mouth so you wouldn't cry and you would be okay. 
So what yeah. do you learn? Or how Eat have something. you been trained? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you've been yeah. trained that, you know, when you're not feeling okay, go get something to eat. Right. Yeah. So, so in the in the Eric Erickson's um, development stages, you know, you have the trust and the mistrust, you know, you have the stage of like, um, where you stuck to a bottle, you know, of just eating all the time, you know, or, or what was it? So when you started sharing that about the emotional eating, it reminded me of Eric Erickson. So so that's what I wanted to share with you all, you know, the, the types of attachment relationships that we built with our children. But now as women, how do we break away from that? And it goes back to everything that Miriam was sharing earlier, you know, it's we, we break away from that, you know, through our, our prayer and our meditation. We break away from that, you know, um, by uh, connecting, you know, um, to Hashem. He's our healer. And then your, your, your meditation that you did with us too, Hannah, that reflects again, that healing, you know, he's the only one that can heal us, you know? Um, but we need to, you know, sometimes we need each other, you know, I need Miriam, I need you. We all need each other, you know, to remind ourselves because I had done this meditation, the, this exercise with you, Hannah, I think like two years ago. And then I did a similar one with Miriam, like maybe like three years when the pandemic started. Remember, Miriam, I was like at home and I was like, oh, my gosh, I feel like the grounded child, you know, um, going from a job where I traveled and flew and was all over the place, you know, and then uh, locked down, you know, um, and feeling grounded like I was punished that I had done something wrong. It's that reflection too of like being alone as a child, you know, being an only child in a home where it was always just myself, my mother, my dad worked, but it, you know, you always need companionship. So um, right now I was like, oh my gosh, I should have done this meditation like last week. <laughs> I needed it. <laughs> so that's oh, my care. Hopefully that's good. That's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. I mean, many clients of mine um, went to all kinds of psychiatric, physical therapy, this, that, that, like they were just couldn't keep food down. They thought they were in the hospital for years in and out. No, it's not a virus. No, there's all the tests, nothing. And I said, did anyone ever ask you like, like how this all started when, like, and did you connect it maybe to your past? So she said after she, I mean, I can't give all the details, but basically after having a baby, it started happening. And just severe nauseousness, throwing up, severe, and it continued after the birth and continued years and years later. And I just like asked her, um, did anyone ask you like, like, how is your relationship to food? No, no, it's because of the pregnancy. Something happened chemically. It ruined my body. I'm like, um, excuse me. Like, I know much. Uh, just listen, hear me out. Like, it could be, you know, Dr. Sarner's work, Dr. Thomas Bradley, you know, the body will fool you. It's, oh, because you are now pregnant and because you're now having the nausea, but it could take you back in time and yes. like trigger like a, a memory of like when you were last nauseous. I said, when you were young, how was your eating habits with your family? And she said to me, well, I was forced to uh, eat everything on my plate till I was nauseous. Hello, nauseous. We did, I taught her about davening and learning, trying to channel her fear and anxiety and the, all the stress that's related to food and, 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 and I did one or two meditations with her of recreating history, of going back in time and seeing the same situation happening, but seeing her as a young child, not eating the whole plate, hearing her mother saying, no, eat until you're satisfied. You don't have to eat, don't pee. You know, I just recreated the history with her. Bam, like years and years of suffering. Um, with this CBTT approach of including the davening, the learning, and, and really helping the brain, you know, heal from these kinds of things. And many cases that had to do with the traumas of their childhood and how the brain just went, um, you know, deep into the past, even though it was like the incident happened so many years. And even though she wasn't having nausea the whole her whole life it just happened to be when she was pregnant and she was nauseous it re her brain went backwards now why did it happen then and there let me tell you 
she stopped praying and davening when she became a mother. And when you stop praying and davening, then your animal soul takes over. Your brain, your what you call your reptilian brain or whatever, it'll go back in time and make associations. The faculty of imagination begins to connect past things with what just happened to you. And many people, even though there was past traumas, when did it start happening? When they stopped learning and davening and this davening and learning and meditating. So um, unbelievable how, yeah. Lech Lecha says that you can leave your past behind. We don't have to be enslaved by trauma. Lech Lecha, you can leave the house of your father. You didn't get the nurture. That yes. you need. Lech Lecha, leave your uh, birthplace, the DNA of your soul. You've been born with a high water element and love pleasure. You can leave that behind because you're going to channel it toward love of Hashem. You can leave the land behind. The land is the bad habits, errors, ruts. You ran toward certain bad habits to escape your traumas. You can leave that behind. Lech lecha. And not only leave it behind all the negative, but use it as a stepping stone to become the real you. This has been a fantastic meeting. Uh, uh, Hannah, you did an amazing job. You stirred all of our hearts up. You're you're such a team member that forever I'm happy you're with me. And I really pray uh, just for all of us to keep helping each other, keep inspiring one another. So we will reach new heights with uh, health and happiness. Thank you. And so if anyone wants to contact me, I'd rather... It texts it text me rather than a uh, phone call because, you know, it's hard for me because I just, my kids are like, here all over. And so um, it's better if you text me um, and I can, I'll try my best. Uh, I can type it up right now in uh, my phone number if anyone wants to. Uh, and so I'm more than happy to Please text me rather than phone call because it's so, so difficult for me to be on the phone. <laughs> so I so I have so much going on. <laughs> so, yeah, Hashem for that. So uh, one last thing I wanted to tell you guys is that something that I recently read is that uh, prayer it actually opens uh, a, a new neural pathways in the brain uh, towards healing, to actually shifting those that trauma and healing it, it changes your brain entirely. So it's in, it's in, exactly, it's right there. It's in, it's in Miriam's book. It changes it entirely. It's, and not just that Miriam says it, it's like, not even, it's like Miriam No, it's it? the research that's showing it. Yeah, there's it's, a book called- They're the... saying it, and it's also what Miriam researched for 30 some more years. <laughs> so experience. So yeah, I, it's just funny yeah. because now I'm hearing I'm hearing people like scientists and all that, and and I'm hearing people like all over the place saying what we have been saying for thirty years, and I'm like, yeah, it's like this person is saying that it's like it's been happening. Yeah. You were saying for thirty years, and so <laughs> um, it's more people should uh, be informed. That's basically it to help people become more informed. Yeah, wow. Wow. Um, by the way, I don't know if you want to, um, and maybe we'll uh, disconnect the recording because maybe I see it's still recording and people might be not comfortable 